Here comes the boom. Freshman Ben Patch leads the Cougars over number one UC Irvine with a record setting match. Pounding the pigskin, the Kings of LES are back to work and the new offensive coaching staff is determined to go fast and go hard. And we're here in Las Vegas. The Cougars are in action today finally and it's madness time and it's time for the tube. <laughs> We have the one and only Taylor Lansford making an appearance with us on KugTube. Thank you, Corey. KugTube feels like home. But let's talk about the WCC tournament. It's been going on for a couple days, but both BYU teams are about to play tonight. I can't wait. Good thing we sent our boys out of the newsroom and down to Vegas. KugTube reporter Sean Gordon is there right now getting set for a big day in BYU hoops. That's right, we're here in Vegas and in less than an hour, it's the tip off of day three of the WCC tournament and BYU will be bookending that play. The women will play first and then the men will get the nightcap taken on, taking on San Diego, but first they had to get past Pepperdine. San Diego established things down low. This power move from Chris Manresa, he'd flirt with a double-double. The waves hung in there though, proving they can bang down low too, getting second chances. Stacy Davis with the and one, he'd score a game high 19 points. But the Toreros were just too much, hitting key buckets down the stretch to advance with the 62-59 win. The other men's game saw LMU take on San Francisco. Big scorer Anthony Ireland didn't disappoint, scoring 16. But up too late, he'd lose control and turn it over. The Dons come out of the scrum with the ball, and San Fran's out on the fast break. Tim Dirksen misses the layup, but Cole Dickerson puts it back to send it into overtime. But Ireland and the Lions were just too much, pulling the 9 over 5 upset 61-60 in OT. LMU will look to continue their Cinderella run against four-seed Santa Clara at 7, followed by the big one, BYU, looking to avenge their earlier loss against San Diego. Well, tonight sets the Cougars off on a must-win tournament run. They're going to have to win it all to punch their dance card. And KuTube reporter Justin Ashby is here with me. Justin, do we have a legitimate shot to shock the conference and win this thing? Well, I should like to see them in the, in the conference championship this weekend. And as they start this road, it's only going to get rougher as they get farther along. A spot in the NCAA tournament would have to mean three wins for BYU this weekend. But the team isn't looking too far ahead. Their biggest focus for right now is tonight against San Diego. Yeah, our, our team's um, used to just focusing on one game at a time, and uh, you can't get too ahead of yourselves. I mean, um, there's lots of good teams in, in, in this conference. San Diego may have beat Pepperdine, but as soon as the game ended, Coach Greer was already thinking about today's game against BYU. We've played twice. I think our guys have some confidence on um, beat at home, but I'm sure BYU is kind of it's all about end of the season urgency, and the Cougars say they are ready for the challenge. The young guys, just like the old, understand it's a last chance shot to make it to the big dance. Uh, we, we need to get a whole group of guys, um, you know, as we go down there to, uh, to, to to play their best basketball of the season. And that urgent feeling, where you, where you realize there's not, there won't be another chance. If Carlino can be a distributor to a quick-scoring Haas and Davies, the Cougars have a chance to win. The team has a 14-1 record when Carlino has at least five assists in the game. And if BYU wins, we'll be playing that team that left a nasty taste in all of our mouths only weeks ago. And hey, if we're lucky, we might be playing the number one team in the nation on Monday. Well, and we almost beat them last week, so you know anything can happen. And switching sides, though, the women saw two games happen, including San Francisco and Loyola Marymount, to determine who would play BYU. San Francisco coming off a big win against Pepperdine, taking on Loyola Marymount. Bailey Barber looks good on this power move. But this game was all LMU. Alex Cowling scored 15 for the Lions. She's the WCC all-time leading scorer. Hazel Ramirez had 15 of her own. The nifty drive and jumper right here as LMU rolled in this one 75-53. Game two saw Santa Clara and Portland. Megan Fulps had a big night, scoring 19 for the Broncos. But the Pilots countered with a balanced attack. Five Portland players scored eight points or more. And with a tie game less than a minute, Jasmine Wooten finds herself wide open for the layup, and Portland wins it 70-64. to 
So LMU advances to take on the Cougars tomorrow at 1. The Lions beat BYU a little more than a week ago. And on the other side of the bracket, Portland will match up with the three-seed St. Mary's. And it's do or die for the Lady Cougars as well if they want to go dancing. And Cougar Troop reporter Jake Edmonds is here with me. Jake, how do they match up against LMU tonight? You know, if you would have asked me that a few weeks ago, I would have said they match up perfectly. It's going to be a great game. But after splitting the regular season, losing last week to Loyola, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Loyola is really going to have their hands full today. A catfight is brewing in Las Vegas as the Lady Cougars prepare to take on the LMU Lions. The key for the Cougars' success? Stop Alex Cowling. She's hurt us twice now, and we we have to, I might look at doubling her a lot more than I, I've done. I think uh, we just need to be real physical with her. Cowling and Lion guard Deanna Johnson shredded the Lady Cougs in Los Angeles last week, scoring a combined 45 points in the win. Both teams are confident going into today. BYU will just be another team for us. They're a great team, but so is everyone else we're facing. It's Division One basketball. They want to kick the ball off the floor. They want to run. They want to shoot the ball, and we want to defend. So we're ready. We struggled with them last week. Um, they kind of threw a, a defense at us that we hadn't seen before, and we struggled with it. But, you know, I think we match up well against them. With the winner go home mentality, the pressure is on for this hoop squad, especially for the seniors. Our only hope is to win the tournament to make it into NCAA. So. Uh, if we do that, that would just be the cherry on top for Haley and I senior year. You want to end on a good note. Um, when you're a sophomore or junior, you know that you have another year to come and, and maybe redeem yourself for, you know, it's the chapter's not closed yet. And so when you're a senior going into the tournament, this is it. If the seniors want to close their final chapter on a good note, they have to start on page one, a win today in Vegas. Now, going into the tournament, Haley Steed and Keilani Unga, they really wanted this matchup. They actually called last week's loss to Loyola a fresh wound, so you can expect them to be prepared going into today's game. Now, speaking of preparation, the WCC puts a lot of it into hosting these events, hosting this tournament, and so we took a chance, we, we had a chance to go behind the scenes, and here's what we found. on this particular event for a year now you know, on and off with everything else that we're doing but it's not just something we roll in the day of or the week of there's a lot of intense planning that goes into this and I guess what most people would be surprised about. We spent a whole day building this giant uh, riser that you see in the background and so it takes about a day to, to build that and it only takes a few hours to put down the court but we put down the basketball court 10 times a year, so we're getting really good at that, and, and it can do that pretty quickly in about four or five hours. This location that we're at right now had to be cleared and coordinated through the arena. They also have to sign off on our cables that are running to all of our cameras through the ceiling, uh, and so they're involved in it. The WCC is a collaborative partner for us throughout the season. BYTV, is, it's been a fantastic partnership. We enjoy having them here. It's been a great partnership, and, uh, and um, we can't say enough good things about them. I call it organized chaos. You have about 15 people in a production space that are all talking at the same time. All right, standing to do this. And uh, it can get very, very chaotic, very overwhelming. We want the viewer at home to think, wow, there must be only two or three people that are working on this because it looks very easy. When in fact, there is actually 40 to 50 people that are working behind the scenes for the viewer at home to enjoy the broadcast. Now, the WCC hosts hundreds of events every year, but Darren Davis told me that this event is the, they actually called it the elite event of the year. So, you know, it's, it's obviously an important event for the WCC mm -hmm. and the Orleans Arena. Well, it looks like you got to have some fun going up in the catwalk, being all over this arena. That'd be pretty fun. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I'm, not, I'm afraid of heights, though, so it, it was a little tough, you know, walking around, but <laughs> I, I managed. No, definitely. Well. We're going to take a break, but we're not done from here in Vegas. When we come back, I head down with WCC Commissioner Jamie Zaninovich and find out about how, what he thought about BYU in year two of the West Coast Conference and the conference going forward. And Patch to the Max will show you BYU's epic 0-2 rally led by the talented freshman to steal the number one ranking from Irvine. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Coog Tube. We're plenty busy down here in Vegas, lots of games to cover, but I did have a chance earlier to sit down with West Coast Conference Commissioner Jamie Zaninovich. 
Commissioner, thanks for being here. It's been a wild, it's been a good basketball season. What are your thoughts so far as we head into the tournament? Well, it's been one of our most competitive seasons that I've seen in five years, both on the on the men's and women's side. And, uh, you know, to have a number one team in the country at the top on the men's side and then others competing for, for postseason bids and uh, but competitive games throughout the year, uh, I think is a testament to, to how deep the conference is getting. And as you look at it, You've got the number one team in the nation in Gonzaga right now. What does that do for the profile of the conference to, to help the conference? Well, it's pretty rare that uh, you have a number one team, obviously, in a, a non-quote-unquote power six conference. So I think the most important thing is it shows that you can do that uh, in the West Coast Conference. And I think that's important. You know, we want programs on the men's and women's side that are that are built for the postseason and built for NCAA tournament. And I think uh, having a number one team in the country, a proven number one team in the country, can do nothing but help that. Although, you know, makes everybody else's job more difficult, too. But that's okay. Oh, definitely. And you look at it, this is BYU's second year in the conference. What first caused you to look at BYU um, when it came to expansion possibilities and what has that done for the conference? In terms of uh, what we looked at, we had been through a whole uh, expansion task force study for over a year before we had any uh, discussions with BYU and, and we frankly didn't expect BYU would even be available because of the, the football element, but when it became clear that BYU was looking for an independent football model, uh, I think we recognized that, that BYU really fit all the attributes that we were looking for uh, in the non-football sports, including a highly competitive national brand uh, in men's basketball and a lot of the other sports. Uh, a school that fits philosophically with our schools, the right market. In terms of what it's done, it's it, it certainly raised the profile of our of our conference. Uh, BYU has a national, international brand, uh, and competitively, they've been what we thought they'd be, which is a top half competitor uh, in, in almost every sport. You look at it from 1980 to 2010, the same eight teams in the WCC. You bring in BYU in 2010. Next year, you've got Pacific coming in. What led you to look at Pacific, and what will they bring in? Well, Pacific has a long history with the West Coast Conference. They were one of our founding members in 1952 and uh, left the conference when they were sponsoring football, now don't sponsor football. Uh, I, I think they fit in a lot of ways. Uh, first and foremost, their competitive success in, in, in men's basketball. They've had great teams in, in women's basketball and women's volleyball. So, so in the sports that we, we cared about, they were there. Uh, and logistically, it helps with some of our scheduling. Uh, you know, we knew about nine school scheduling when we, uh, when we brought BYU in, but I think living it, uh, people have realized it's even more difficult than they, than they thought it might be. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. It's great to be with, be with you, and I'm uh, glad you guys can make it to the tournament. Well, we're going to wrap it up here and get ready for the BYU women's game in less than an hour, but we'll be back on Monday. We'll look at the action from the weekend, see how the Cougars did, and hopefully we'll also be previewing some championship games that involve BYU. But for now, in Las Vegas, I'm Sean Gordon with Jake Edmonds and Justin Ashby for CougTube. Wow, a lot happened in Vegas. Thanks, Sean. While the men's basketball team chases a conference championship in Vegas, the men's volleyball team is in the middle of their own title chase. Freshman phenom Ben Patch and the Cougars were in Cali to take on number one ranked UC Irvine, and it was all Patch. If this were Halo, he would be, as the kids say, pony noobs. Call it what you want, killing spree, killtacular, Kilimanjaro. I'm not familiar with those terms because I'm terrible at Halo, but Patch was unstoppable. Kid had 35 kills. That's a BYU rally scoring record. The Cougs actually, actually trailed this match 2-0 but came roaring back. Match point here and the Lava Monster finishes things off with the Mammoth Block. Patch takes NPSF Player of the Week honors, no surprise there, and BYU takes the match 3-2. The Cougs trampled their way to another win on Saturday as they took on the UC San Diego Tritons. BYU service ace leader Taylor Sander helped pull out the victory by racking up two more aces and 14 kills. UCSD kept the first two sets close, but it wasn't enough to stop the Cougars. With Sander leading the way, BYU dominated the third set, leaving the Tritons in the dust and completing the sweep. Because of those road games, BYU is back on top as the nation's number one team, and they're back in Provo for a pair of matches this weekend. The Cougar Crazies welcome Cal Baptist to the Fieldhouse Friday and Saturday. BYU will need to figure out a way to stop Levi Cabral. He's a Swiss Army knife on the court and leads the nation in points per set. The Lancers are 12th in the nation, coming off a three-set sweep of Pacific last week. With football starting up again, we get our first look as Cougars' new offensive coaching staff. CougTube reporter Mark Chalice has been suffering from football withdrawals for almost three months, haven't we all? And he joins us in the newsroom. Mark, how's the new offense looking? Taylor, to be honest, it looked really sloppy out, mm -hmm. out there. The new offensive coaches are running the players a lot harder and a lot faster than they're used to. 
But all eyes this year are going to be on the offensive line. That's a crew that really struggled last season. A new coaching staff generally means growing pains for a football team, and the Cougar offensive line is no exception. I'm still a long, long ways to go, uh, but they're embracing the standard that we're setting, and that's the biggest step. Eventually the mastery and execution will come, but we're working them hard, and they're, they're doing it. New offensive coordinator Robert Anai calls his offense, go hard, go fast. All the offense players will have to adjust and condition for what is basically a hurry-up system. Offense presents a challenge for the linemen. Being 300 pounds and trying to run a play every 20 to 30 seconds isn't easy. Last year, BYU's quarterback spent a lot of time running around under former OC Brandon Doman style of QB draws and option reads. The revamping of the line in a nice pocket passing system will be key to having a successful season come fall. My emphasis is to have a dominating offensive line, to exert our will, to steal that will from other men. Uh, that will be our main focus. A large group of recruits from high school and junior college will join them all. At that point, the coaching staff will make final decisions about the lineup. In 2013, the Cougars will face four teams that were ranked in the top 25 last season. With a schedule like that, they're going to need some solid play from their offensive line. Live in the newsroom, Mark Chalice, CougTube. All right, thanks, Mark. Excited about football. Isn't it great? It's March 8th, and we're, we're not, talking about football. We're not even done with basketball. I can't talk about football. Oh, I love so it. So when CougTube returns, Utes take Provo after a dominant performance on the gym floor. Women's tennis helps Utah take the front seat in the Deseret First Duel. And baseball is back. BYU played their first home game of the season, and with it came a chance to knock off another top 25 team. We'll be right BYU Gymnastics left the Deseret Duel trophy slip through their fingers yet again. The Utes have dominated gymnastics for decades, and on Friday night, they kept the streak going. BYU put up their second best score of the season in the tri meet, but unfortunately, it was the second best score of the night as the Utes won by nearly two full points. North Carolina State finished third. Gymnastics wasn't the only team that played the youths this week. Women's tennis competed in their, in their Deseret duel on Saturday. Junior Deseret Tran started the match off right by giving Utah's Teresa Bar Barakarava a run for her money, but D. Tran's sick returns weren't enough as she felt short of Bakarava in three sets overall. The Cougars only scored in two of the five sets, and Utah came away with the win. A quarter of the season has passed, but the BYU baseball team hasn't felt their home dirt under their cleats. Until this week, Coop 2 reporter Fong Pham shows us how playing on the road has helped the boys get tough for their home openers. Leading off the season away from snowy Provo has become a tradition for BYU baseball. Cougar ball players posted a decent 7-6 and six record on the road, including splitting a series with number 2 LSU. Junior third baseman Adam Law has been instrumental for the Cougars' offense leading the team in batting average and on-base percentage, and slugging second only to outfielder Jacob Bruckman. I mean, I feel good. I've, I've worked really hard in the offseason. I've come a long way from where I was at last year. Uh, my knowledge of the game has grown, and my mechanics have improved a lot. Playing on the road hasn't only helped the players improve their mentality, but it also creates a camaraderie among the team. We've lost a couple close ones, won a couple close ones, and that kind of brings the team together. And, and uh, I think overall right now we just really feel like we can compete with anybody in the country. With confidence from the road trip and the help of home fan support here at Miller Park, the Cougs are ready to protect the plate against top opponents. This weekend series against number 21 UC Irvine is the first obstacle for the fearless Cougars to prove themselves. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge for us, but, but again, we want to come out. Uh, we're at home. We want to win the series. We want to set the precedent that we're that we're going to win home series and, and take care of business here at home. At Miller Park, Fong Pham, Coop 2. It's a quick home stand. The Cougars go back on the road to San Diego next week, but they'll return to Miller Park for two straight home series at the end of March. Utah Valley native Jacob Hanneman led the Cougars offense last night against 21st ranked UC Irvine. BYU ace Desmond Polson gave up two earned in six and two thirds, but walked away with a no decision. In the seventh, a broken bat single sparked a two out rally of epic proportions. Hanneman picked up his second RBI on his second triple of the night. Jacob Rugman kept the rally going with a two run double. Submarine reliever Derek Spigman got the 6 3 win. When Coog Tube comes back, Rugby ruckus with Utah State in town. The national champs try to put 100 points on the board. Find out how close they got. We've got baseball and rugby this weekend. Your 11 game time weather when we return. Want to see a blowout? 
Let's watch some rugby. Roll that highlight. BYU absolutely stomped Utah State on, at Southfield on Saturday. The final score, get ready for this, was 91 to three. I'm not kidding. The Cougs did whatever they wanted. I mean, at some point, you almost feel bad. Almost. BYU shows why they're the reigning champs and cruise in a laugher. That was a crazy win. BYU crushing Utah State in Provo was a solid home debut, but their next home match is going to be a little different. Coug Tube reporter Stephanie Campbell shows us how the Cougs are getting ready to take on last year's Super League champs. There's no question the Cougars showed off their skills last Saturday, but this week they're preparing for something special, something they're calling the Champions Challenge. Scoring try after try, the rugby team showed why they are the defending collegiate national champions. But this week, they're getting ready to scrum with a higher level opponent, opponent defending, defending Super, League, Super champion, League champion, the New York, the Athletic, New York Club. Athletic Club. This, this, is a, this is a first time thing, and so it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty exciting playing them. The Super League is the highest level of rugby competition in the country. NYAC won last year's championship 32 to 29 over Seattle OPSB for their fourth title in eight years and their roster has four players who also play for the U.S. national team. They're a very experienced men's team, so they've uh, got a lot of players that have played on an inter international level at a very high level in this country and other countries. So we're, we're expecting a, a very hard game, but we're up for the challenge and we're going to give it the best that we have. Tomorrow's Champions Challenge will be the first meeting between BYU and NYAC. I'm actually really excited for the challenge. I think it'll show us really where we're at for the season. They're really going to exploit, I guess, our weaknesses. You could say the things we need to work on for the upcoming Varsity Cup playoffs. Both teams may have gained and lost players since last year, but even with the differences, the match still boasts some of the best players in the United States. This is no doubt one of Southfield's most highly anticipated matches. KSL will be streaming the Champions Challenge live online tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Well, it's kind of a little bit hazy outside. We got a lot of those clouds there. Tonight, there might be rain for baseball, uh, so that might be no good. You guys see the rain tarp there. If we check out what's going on right now, we've got 36 degrees. Wind speeds are pretty calm, so it's, it's a decent day right now. Tomorrow, though, for the rugby and baseball games, things are going to be a little bit different. We've got highs of 44. Uh, we've got a pretty good chance of precipitation there. We don't know if it's rain or snow. Um, the wind speeds are going to be picking up as well, so that is going to be an interesting day tomorrow. Could be good, could be bad. If we check out what's going on on the bigger scale, you can see the storm right there for us hitting the whole state really good. That's kind of where that precipitation is coming from. Going to what's going to be happening throughout the rest of the week, it's going to be really nice starting at 46 and just that steady climb all the way up, all the way up into those 60s even which could give us a nice, you know, a nice good rest of the week for then. So I'm really excited for it. Um, it's going to be pretty good weather. We're not seeing too much weather other than that rain that's going to be going on tomorrow. So uh, it's going to be really enjoyable. I'm going to enjoy it, guys. Thanks, Clint, Thanks, but I miss the bow tie. Bring it back. Oh, the bow tie is I love classic the bow tie. touch. That's Coop 2 for Friday, March 8th. If you want to look at another, uh, another look at the stories we did today or share with your friends, check out the Coop Tube section of our website, 11news.byu.edu. Thanks for joining us. Have a great afternoon, and make sure to catch the Cougars tonight in Vegas.